like a great day for petrology and specifically mantle petrology. We'll break this up into three lectures, each around 15 minutes. The textbook talks about the mantle in pages 40 to 44, 288 to 294, and 299 to 305. These are, the pages in the text are pretty geochemistry heavy, which only ties into part of the lecture we're going into today. If you need other information, I really do recommend Wikipedia as a good source. So Roman numeral one under mantle petrology is going to build off of what we already know. So what we already know. What we've learned in other classes and earlier in the semester. One of the earlier lectures this year, I talked about how this mantle is about 84% of the volume of the Earth, and it's a body that's 2,900 kilometers thick. This is the majority of the Earth. Something else that we already know is the geotherm, right? And how the geotherm works throughout the Earth's interior. So I'm going to say recall the geotherm. And how does the geotherm impact the interior of the mantle? Well, one thing we learned is that almost, well, the mantle is below, the mantle essentially, right, resides below the solidus, which means it should not melt. But there were these unique conditions that allowed the mantle to cross the solidus and have melting, right? And so those were the three ways to melt. Two of them in particular are relevant to this discussion, and it's going to be the minus P mechanism and the plus X hydration mechanism. Those are ways that you melt the primary mantle. And these bits of information allow us to make three big conclusions about the, the mantle. So we're going to go like this, we're going to go here, three conclusions conclusions. The first is that there is some melt in the mantle. Most of it's solid, but there is some melt. If there is some melt, then that means there has to be parts of the mantle that are have been melted before, and we call those areas infertile mantle. This is a residuum that has previously been melted. So this has areas that have been previously melted before. Their chemistry is going to be different from pristine mantle, which we call fertile mantle. This has never been melted and pristine mantle. These are some conclusions that we can make just from the geotherm. Now we know more about the mantle than just that because we can also recall plate tectonics. Recall tectonics. And if we were to make a quick sketch of tectonics, and yours can be better than mine, we've got mid-ocean ridge spreading centers, right, that are moving apart. Then in the mid-ocean, well, then at some point you're going to hit a continent, and when there's continent, there's going to be subduction, right, that's going down into the mantle. We make volcanoes here, right, your sketch is going to be better than mine. But what we've learned, there's a couple things we can assume, or um, not assume, but that we know from tectonics, and that is some material is cycled down into the mantle, like even recycled. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're just going to call it material mixes into mantle via subduction. That's one thing we know. And then another thing we know is that the mantle moves. Right? We draw these arrows. There's an arrow. Here's an arrow. Here's an arrow. There's some that we left out, right? Because if there's open space being created by the pull apart, well, then mantle can move vertically at a mid-ocean ridge. Mantle can also move vertically at a hotspot plume, which we can create things like Hawaii and volcanoes, right? So we have mantle can move, and we've learned that from plate tectonics. The rates are not fast. It's like a millimeter per year, but, sorry, mantle can move. We think of it oftentimes as a plastic, millimeters per year rates. So really high viscosity stuff. So that's some background information about the mantle that we already know that we need to just kind of bring to the forefront of our mind as we go into this topic. Now, we can also make some additional logical deductions from that information. We call this logical deductions all right from above we can make some logical deductions and one is that the mantle has compositional heterogeneity all right if we're mixing stuff into the mantle it can be compositionally 
heterogeneous. And so we're going to put that down. Mantle has compositional heterogeneities. Geneities. And the second thing is that the mantle has structural heterogeneities. I'll let you know how we can deduce that later. Mantle has structural heterogeneities. Genei. Oh boy, I'm spelling that wrong. Spell it heterogeneities. There it is. And the reason why we know that it can have structural heterogeneities has to do with Le Chatelier's principle. And that is, as we go to higher pressures, deeper and deeper into the mantle, new minerals should be favored, right? New minerals that have a denser structure in particular. And so we're going to say here that increasing pressure with depth favors denser minerals. And so we should expect, as we go in deeper into the mantle, that the mineralogy changes, right, based on Le Chatelier's principle. That's Le Chatelier's principle. And these are two important concepts, and they are entirely true. So let's go now to Roman numeral three and look at these changes. First, starting with structure of the mantle. Much of what we know about the mantle comes from the field of seismology. And the reason for that is we cannot see the mantle, right? We can never get, uh-oh, what's happened here? Close, thank you. The structure of the mantle, it's not something that we can ever see. And so it has to be inferred from geophysics. Inferred from geophysics and seismology. Where we look at how earthquake waves travel through the Earth's interior, the, we call them the, like, the VP, right? The P wave velocity and VS. And we look at how fast they're moving and the directions that we're moving to infer a density structure. That ends up being what a geophysicist does who's working on the mantle. Here's an image I pulled from a textbook that just kind of shows how earthquake waves radiating from a single epicenter will move with different trajectories and different speeds through the Earth's interior. And as they arrive at different positions on the far side of the Earth or nearby, we can understand the Earth's structure. I'm gonna, okay, so there's that. So what is the actual structure of the mantle? We're gonna address that with two drawings right next to one another, okay? Um, we're gonna have, here's gonna be the surface of the Earth. Okay, come on, pen. Oops, of course, we're on picture mode still. Got to go to writing mode. There's the surface of the Earth. And then we're also going to have another graph, and then we're going to go deeper from there. We'll save space until the bottom of the page. And then here we're going to have another graph. The straight line. Oh, make your straighter. Here's a straight line. And here we're going to plot density in kilograms per meters cubed as you go deeper into the Earth. So this will be 2,000, here is 3,000, here is 4,000, here is 5,000. So we could put that 2,000, 4,000, 5,000. And here now, let's go depth. So that's 200 kilometers. So we'll go depth, 200 kilometers, 400 kilometers, 600 kilometers, and 800 kilometers. All right, so that is depth in kilometers. And what geophysics has taught us is that we have the very shallow crust of the earth, which ranges, I kind of like how I did that actually, the crust of the earth ranges between five kilometers depth at an ocean and in continents, it's like 30 to 40 kilometers depth, and the contact between the crust and the lithospheric mantle is called the moho. So then the next layer we're gonna draw in is the lithosphere. Lithosphere. It ends up ranging anywhere from 100 to 200 kilometers thick. We'll write this down after we finish our drawing. At first we're just gonna start with our drawing. Underneath this we have, so this is now all rigid. It does not 
deform, it does not viscously flow. But underneath the mo underneath the lithosphere is a region of the mantle called the asthenosphere, which is able to flow and convect at these rates of millimeters per year, right? Where the word plastic is more appropriate. Nothing really changes as you go through the asthenosphere until you get to around 410 kilometers depth. 410. When you get there, there's something called a discontinuity. And that means we're going to plot it here. And what it ends up being is that there's a density discontinuity with a big change. Then at 660, there's another one of these. It's called the 660 discontinuity. And they're at kilometer depth. It's 410 and 610 kilometers. Everything below 600, this is, or 660, this is called the lower mantle. And this area in between is called the transition zone. When it comes to density structure that we know from the speed of VP and VES waves is that the crust is around 2700. And it goes to about 30 kilometers depth. At that depth, we get a big step up in the density to around 3300 as we get into the peridotite of the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. We actually know that it's peridotite in part just from the VPVS waves because that's how fast material goes. Now at 220, now this will kind of, the density increases gently as you go deeper and then there's a step up at 220. There's another step up at the 410. Let's see, how far does it step up? Still, we're under 4,000. And then at 660, there's another big, whoops, that's supposed to be a straight line that slightly increases till about 660, where you get a step up to over 4,000, and then another increase. And so this is the density structure of the Earth's interior, where we have the moho showing a big step, a discontinuity at 220, which doesn't show up over here in our sketch. We'll ignore it. Then there's the 410, which has a big step up, and then the 660. The reason for these step ups from 410 to 660 and um, the one at 410, the one at 660 and the one at 410 has to do with phase transformations of minerals, where olivine is the stable form at shallow depths. But at 410, there is a transition from olivine to a new mineral called woodsleyite. 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 Woodsleyite transitions to another mineral called ringwoodite, and then at 660, ringwoodite turns into a mineral called bridgemanite. Each of these minerals has the chemical formula of olivine, which, if we were in class right now, I'd put you on the spot. What is the chemical formula? Well, it's Mg2SiO4. So each of these are polymorphs, essentially, of Mg2SiO4 that have different structures. Well, Wadsley, Wadsleyite is orthorhombic, and ringwoodite is isometric. And then bridgemanite is also isometric. It has technically has a different chemical formula. It's slightly different, though. It's just MgSiO3. And then there's another mineral down here called MgO, which is periclase. Okay, now that is the structure of the Earth's interior. Now we need to put a couple more of these notes down in our piece of paper before we can end today's lecture. So what I want to do here is just make sure we have this down organized in our notes. So we're going to say, A, seismic wave travel times. depend on density. All right, so that's how we're able to figure out changes in the mantle that we cannot see. At our shallowest depth, we have one, it's the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the rigid upper mantle and crust. Rigid upper mantle plus crust. It is 100 kilometers thick or so at the oceans and around 200 kilometers thick at the continental crust areas.
The good thing is about the lithosphere is that we actually see it and can feel it and can touch it because we can sample it in a variety of different ways. It's sampled by xenoliths. This is the topic of next lecture. Xenoliths, ophiolites, and um, abyssal peridotites. We'll discuss all those next time. Peridotites. The number two here is asthenosphere. This is the mantle that can flow, or the shallow mantle that can flow. Let's put it, let's say shallow to middle mantle. That can flow. It goes down to about 410 down to 410 kilometers. This is rarely sampled, but it is occasionally sampled by really deep xenoliths. Rarely sampled. Things like diamonds would be examples of material from the asthenosphere. And then three, this is our last part of our notes today. This is called the transition zone. The transition zone we break up it goes from 410 to 660 kilometers depth. We break it up into two parts. The first part we want we should talk about is the 410 kilometer discontinuity. The reason why it's a discontinuity is because it's a discontinuity in density where the density and VP waves, these things both increase by about 5%. The reason for that increase in density is because olivine, MgSiO4, Mg is, is turning into Wadsleyite. And that transition makes a more dense structure in that orthorhombic Wadsleyite. Now at 520, or so kilometers depth, we have another transition where orthorhombic Wadsleyite, let's see here, let's see, so we're gonna go Wadsleyite transitions, doesn't change its chemical formula at all, but it turns into ringwoodite, ring woodite, which is again, it's more denser because it is isometric. And that creates an increase in the VP VS waves. And then probably the, the most famous of all the discontinuities is the 660 discontinuity. Here, the density and the VP waves increase. It's different depending on where you are on Earth, but it's anywhere between 6 to 11 percent increase. And it's an increase in density because ringwoodite, isometric ringwoodite, turns into two different minerals, which is called bridgmanite and periclase. This is the most common mineral on earth. Mineral inside, because there's so much vast interior of the planet that's made up of Bridgmanite, which is MgSiO3, and then periclase, which is MgO. So we still get the balance back to Mg2SiO4. There's all sorts of really interesting phenomena that might occur at the 660. The one that I want you to know about is that earthquakes never occur deeper than 660. Earthquakes are never deeper than 660. So they think this might be where subduction zones go to die. Or we also call that sometimes in the literature, ponding of subduction slabs, because they maybe they can never push deeper past this transition to bridgmanite, maybe because of an increase in viscosity or something like that. So earthquakes never deeper than 660. Maybe here we have ponding of slabs. All right, that's it for this one. We'll see you on the next one to get more into the mantle.